Hi guys, Ben here from Ben's Guide and welcome to today's video where I'm going to be sharing with you the best photography settings for the Canon EOS RP. But as a little added bonus, if you're an EOS R owner, then you can actually apply these photography settings to that camera as well and get the same desired outcome. The video today has timestamps because I know there's lots of people out there that like to flick between the video at different stages. And if that's you, then you can use these timestamps to watch the video in the order that you want to. Now, if there's anyone which has been watching the channel for a while, or even if you're new here, then I would love to invite you to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell just so you get notified of future videos like this. Autofocus settings can be found here. It's the first option in your LCD screen. And then you can see that you've got these options at the bottom to choose from. Now, when I'm photographing people, I always use face tracking and eye autofocus. So the reason for this is because I've done quite a few weddings and portrait shoots, and I've found that this has always been fast and reliable, and it's kept people in focus. So why wouldn't I continue to use it? Plus, when I've actually tried other options, like using the single point autofocus here, it's actually quite difficult to chase your subject around the um, frame and then try and keep them in focus. And that's why I always use eye autofocus here or face tracking. I use this option to photograph people with. Now, of course, if I'm not photographing people, I will never choose this option. I will flip between two options. The first one is the zone, the single one point autofocus, sorry. And the other one is the zone autofocus. The difference between these two options is one point autofocus is small. So it's great to take pictures of smaller objects with this because it's only a small focus area. Now you can actually take this down even to a smaller size because you have this option here, which is even smaller as you can see there. Now, of course, if I want to take photos of bigger things like uh, landscapes, buildings, things like that, I would always choose this option, which is the zone autofocus. If I click back, you can see that the focus area here is a lot bigger and it's going to be more suitable for them kind of scenes. Next up is autofocus operation. You've got two options. You can choose between one shot and servo. Let's briefly explain what these are. So one shot is good for taking pictures of subjects which are not moving. So if you've just got someone standing still or you're taking a picture of a product which you know is not going to be moving on its own, then one shot is exactly what you need. But of course, if you've got moving things in your scene, servo is the way to go. And this is going to be perfect for anything like wildlife, action or sports, anything where the subject is actually moving you can use this mode and track your subject through the scene. Now I actually flip between both of these options because I need both of them in the styles of photography I do. And it's as easy as just clicking on here and then flicking between them. So it's not something that's gonna take you a long time if you do need to flip between both options. Drive mode is the third one down, it's found here. And you've got a bunch of drive modes which you can choose from. The first one is just a single shooting and that means when you hold down your shutter button and press it's just going to take a single photo. Next up you have continuous modes. Now these mean that if you hold down the shutter button you will continue to fire off shots. You have low speed continuous which means that you will fire at a slower speed and then of course you have high speed continuous which is an option which provides you quicker shooting. You can see by holding down the shutter here, I can fire off at a faster rate. Now, these are particularly good for actually taking photos in situations where you need to capture lots of photos. So for instance, if you're capturing the movement of an animal or sports action scenes, and you want to get all different areas of the subject moving around, then things like high speed continuous are going to be perfect for things like that. Next up, we have a bunch of timing methods. Now these are timers that you can set yourself. You've got 10 seconds where you hold down the shutter. 
it will take a 10 second uh, timer and then it will take a photo after the 10 seconds has elapsed. You've also got two seconds timer, which you can see here. And then you've got this option here, which is actually where you can press the button to shoot a set number of images in 10 seconds. Now this is really handy if you want to capture a bunch of continuous images, but you also want to set the timer because let's say you're the subject you, you want to photograph. You can't take the photo while be moving around in the scene. Next up is metering modes. Now this is actually quite important, but I'm gonna keep this part really simple. There's four to choose from. I nearly always use a valetive metering, which is the first one here. Um, in Canon cameras, it's always called a valetive. In others, it might be called matrix. But a valetive metering basically takes an average of the light in your scene. And then it bases the exposure uh, from the photo that you take off that. Now, in a lot of cases, this is gonna work really well for most of the scenes that you're photographing in. But when I'm shooting people, I tend not to use this setting and I tend to go for spot metering. And it's because it's really important with spot metering that you can meter off someone's skin. And this will ensure that you don't underexpose or overexpose the skin. And you need to make sure you're getting the kind of exposure correct because if you're taking photos for clients, you can't be getting it wrong and overexposing or underexposing on the skin. So spot metering is a really good option to go for where you can actually choose the exposure based on the skin and make sure that you keep that area at the right exposure level. With image format, you're gonna hear a lot of people in videos, say on YouTube or where it is, say that you need to use RAW. You always need to shoot in RAW. Now this is simply not true because it completely depends upon the photographer that you are. Yes, RAW is a better file format for retaining information, which means that you can work with this when you're doing editing in programs like Lightroom and Photoshop. But listen, if you're just the kind of photographer that enjoys taking snaps of the family, friends, your pets, and you're not going to do absolutely any editing after, then I highly recommend that you stick with JPEG. It's a smaller file format, it's gonna take less room up on your memory card, which is gonna save you more money in the long run. Also, Canon has some really nice color profiles, which we're gonna talk about in a bit, which you can actually add onto your JPEG, and it gives some really nice natural colors, which makes your photos look even better. Now, of course, if you're the kind of photographer who actually is more serious, you're an enthusiast or you're a professional and you want to edit your photos after, then you've got to be choosing RAW because you don't want to be editing JPEGs as they will fall apart when you're doing the editing process. Of course, RAW is not that way and you have more information in the photo, which means that you can edit them and you can get a lot more out of the photo and move it around as much as you want to get your desired effect. White balance is a super simple one for me because I always keep it, well, not always, but most times I keep it on auto white balance. The reason for that is because modern cameras do a really good job at choosing the right color for your scene. You see, white balance is there to determine the color that you see through your camera matches the scene that you're photographing. So you wouldn't want to take a picture of, say, a sunset and then the color is really blue you'd want to make sure that you're choosing the right option within your camera white balance settings so it matches that nice golden color that you get from a beautiful sunset. Automatic white balance though is the option that I choose most times because it gives you great effects and you don't have to. Automatic white balance though is the option that I choose for nearly everything because with the Canon EOS RP, I find that the white balance when it's automatic does a really good job. Well, hey, listen, sometimes it's not gonna do a good job. And if that's the case, you've got your scenes which you can choose from. So the next one will be daylight, which means that you need to use this for outdoor scenes under clear skies. You've got um, shade, which is good for shaded. You've got cloudy, which is good for cloudy. And as you work your way through these, you can see that they're all self-explanatory. You can use the desired one for the scene that you're shooting in. And of course, you can change this to custom. And finally, you can change the Kelvin temperature 
yourself. This means that you can make it like warmer or colder temperatures. And this is good if you want to add some effects to your photos as well. Now picture profiles here are actually really neat because if you're shooting in JPEG, you now have the option to add these profiles onto your photos. You can see that this one is portrait. It's ideal for close-ups of people, it's smooth skin, tone and hair. You've also got landscape, which is going to be perfect for landscape shots. This gives you vivid blue skies and green foliage in your photos. Now these are really nice to add on to JPEG images. It gives you just the kind of photo which matches your scene and it just makes it look a bit more colorful. Also, you've got things like monochrome, which means that you can shoot in black and white and you can just add this straight away. So you don't have to edit to get this black and white look when you're post editing. Also, you've actually got ones which you can change yourself as well if you fancy doing that. In crop mode, you can choose your own aspect ratio. So for instance, if I wanted to use choose full here, I could choose that and that means I'm going to take a full frame picture using the whole sensor. I could use one by one to get this square crop here. If I wanted to crop my images to this square look, you can go four by three, which gives you more width than square, or you can go 16 by nine, which of course is video. This means that if you want to take pictures of say a YouTube thumbnail or something like that for your video, you'd always use 16 by nine because that's gonna match your video aspect ratio and it's gonna be perfect when you upload it to YouTube. Now, my rule of thumb for shutter speed is if I'm shooting handheld and I don't have a lens which has uh, image stabilization built in, I'm gonna be shooting at one over 250 to avoid any camera shake. But say if my lens does have stabilization, then I can bring this down to uh, one over 125 and I find that that's good enough. Of course, if you're going to be using this on a tripod, you can actually set your um, shutter speed as low as you want. So if you want to capture moving subjects and blur them out, say when you're photographing waterfalls, you can bring it all the way down to something like 30 seconds, capture a long exposure at 30 seconds. And this means that because you've got the tripod, you don't have to worry about camera shake. My aperture depends really what I'm shooting and how much light I need. If I'm taking a photo of someone, I want to make sure that the background's blurred and all my focus is on the person. This means I'm gonna be using as low an aperture as I possibly can. Now I can only go down to F4 on this lens, but I would be using the lowest aperture that I could use on my lens to get as much of the background blurred and to keep the subject as sharp as possible. Now, of course, this is gonna change if you're photographing something like a landscape where you wanna get the whole of the scene in focus. In that case, I'm gonna be choosing an aperture of F8 upwards to around about F16. This means that I can ensure I get all of my scene in focus. But of course, I will have to make sure that my shutter speed and ISO are dialed in correctly to ensure that if I'm using a smaller aperture, then I'm going to get enough light in my scene. Finally, let's look at ISO. See, I use ISO to balance out my exposure or my light depending on the shutter speed and aperture settings that I need. I always try to keep my ISO as low as possible, and that's usually between the range of 100 up to 400. Now, of course, the reason to do this is to make sure that you keep your image as clean as possible and you don't introduce any grain into it. Of course, unless you're going for that kind of look. But there are circumstances where you can't keep your ISO low and you actually have to bump it up in low light situations where you're shooting handheld. If that's the case, I find that I never really go above 6400. And if I do, it's in extreme situations. But the general rule of thumb with ISO is to try and keep it as low as possible, like I do around about 100 to 400, which means you're gonna get a clean, clean image with no grain. And then this should, as long as you get your shutter speed and aperture correct, give you enough light in your scene. I really hope that today's video is gonna serve as some kind of helpful 
and valuable guide for people looking to use photography settings with their Canon EOS RP. A little bit of advice would be to go out and experiment with these photography settings and then develop your own style so that you can set yourself out from other photographers. Okay guys, I wanna say a big thank you to you for joining me today and make sure you hit subscribe and that notification bell if you haven't already and whatever you do for the rest of the day. Make sure it's a good one and I'll see you in the next video.